let A be an n by n matrix over the complex numbers. We define the commutant of A to be the set of all n by n matrices X, such that X times A equals A times X. That is, the commutant of A is a set of all matrices that commute with A. Now, the commutant of A will be a subspace of the vector space of n by n matrices. We want to show that the dimension of our subspace is greater than or equal to n. To start, let's consider A diagonal. Then A commutes with every diagonal matrix. The set of diagonal matrices is a subspace of dimension n. So we'll have that the commutant of A has dimension greater than or equal to n. To get a feel for this, we should consider a few examples. So you should compare the commutants for the identity matrix 1, 1, 2, and 1, 2, 3. Now, in general, one approach we could try, I'll take characteristic polynomial of A, then I could form the minimal polynomial of A, and that's gonna give me a subset identity matrix A, A squared, all the way up through A to the K minus one, where K is the degree of the minimal polynomial. This set will be linearly independent, It'll be a subset of the commutant of A. So we see that the dimension of the commutant is greater than or equal to K, where K is the degree of the minimal polynomial. So this approach is only going to work if our minimal polynomial is equal to our characteristic polynomial. For a non-trivial example, let's let A be equal to this matrix here. The minimal polynomial of our A is going to be equal to lambda squared. So if we try to form the set, we're only going to get the identity matrix and A itself. If I work out the commutant of A by hand, we're going to get the set of all matrices in this form. So our commutant will be eight dimensional. So if our minimal polynomial equals our characteristic polynomial, we get our result without doing any computation. In general, we use Jordan canonical form. Now, our first step is to note it's enough to consider our result only for matrices that are already in Jordan form. Because we're over the complex numbers, every matrix A is similar to a matrix J in Jordan form. That means there's some change of basis with matrix P, such that A and J are similar by conjugation by P. If that's the case, then the commutant of A is just given by taking the commutant of J and then conjugating by P. So that'll follow by interpreting this equation here. Now, that puts the focus on Jordan forms. So let's consider the case where our A is an N by N Jordan block J. So note here, we're gonna have our eigenvalue going down the diagonal. There'll be ones on the diagonal above the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So we can write J as a sum of two matrices, C times the identity matrix plus the matrix N, which is just the matrix of all zeros except for ones above the main diagonal. Taking a closer look at N, we know N and J commute. So if we write J as C times I plus N, N commutes with I, N commutes with itself, so N commutes with J. Then N to the N minus first power is not zero, but N to the nth power is zero. We'll see in a little bit, if we multiply any matrix on the right by N, the effect is to shift your matrix to the right by one, fill in the first column with zeros. So if we multiply n by itself n minus one times, we're just gonna shift enough so that we have zeros everywhere except for a one in the upper right hand corner. So non-zero. If I multiply by one more n on the right, then that one is gonna get pushed off. We'll have zeros everywhere. So n to the nth power is zero. That means 
a minimal polynomial. It's going to be lambda to the n. And we'll have that the set i, n, n squared up through n to the n minus 1 is linearly independent. Now, this set is going to be a subset of the commutant of j. We have n elements here. So the dimension of the commutant of j is greater than or equal to n. And that's our result. It's worth noting, in this case, the dimension of the commutant is precisely n. So that'll say, if we take the commutant of j, we can write each matrix in here in the form, okay? So we're gonna have constants down every diagonal. If we're at the main diagonal or above, we can let that constant be any number we like. If we're below the main diagonal, it has to be zero. To see the equality, suppose x and j commute. That statement is equivalent to saying that x and n commute. Okay, we can remove c times the identity from the equation. So I want to see what happens when we multiply x times n and n times x. Now, if we represent our matrices as column vectors, so I'll suppose we can write x as, okay, the columns v1 through vn. Our matrix n is going to start with the column of zero vectors, and then we follow it with the standard basis vectors. So we have e1 through e to the n minus 1. So, take our matrix times a zero column, we get a zero out, and then the recipe for multiplying a matrix represented as column vectors times ith standard basis vector is to pick off the ith column. So, e sub one goes to v1, e sub two goes to v2, e sub n minus one goes to v sub n minus one. So we notice here, the effect of multiplying on the right by n is to shift our matrix over by one, fill in the first column with zeros. Now, in a similar manner, if I multiply n times x, we think of things in terms of the rows, and then when you track out what's happening, same idea, we're gonna shift everything up by one, and then we're gonna fill in the last row with zeros. If we set these two equal to each other, if we unspool all the equations, we'll wind up getting x as on the previous board. Now, let's just check it out explicitly in the three by three case. So let's suppose I have our matrix X, okay, entries A, B, C, all the way up through I. X times N shifts everything to the right by one. N times X shifts everything up by one. When we set these two equal to each other, what do we have? We'll have A equals E equals I, B equals F. C can be anything, since it doesn't appear in either matrix. And then I have D equals G equals H equals zero. When I put this all together, we wind up getting this matrix here for X, and we note it's of the form that we noted before. So the statement over here is at least believable. Getting back to our problem, we assume that our matrix J is in Jordan canonical form. That means J is block diagonal. The diagonal blocks are Jordan blocks J sub I, and we have zeros off the main diagonal. Now, a recipe for constructing elements in the commutant of J. For each I, we'll choose a C sub I and the commutant of J sub I, and we form the following block diagonal matrix. If we take the subspace of all such matrices in the commutant of J, that subspace has dimension n. So to see that, we note that the dimension of each commutant of J sub i is equal to the size of the block. So if I take the sum of the sizes of the blocks, we get the size of J, which is n. That's our result. The dimension of the commutant of J is greater than or equal to n.